All right, welcome to the second of our um, official meetings, the third, including our orientation. So today we're going to focus primarily on planning and building publishing programs and projects. You <laughs> think we may have almost a comedic uh, meeting today talking about programs and projects and projects and programs. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and, and I know there are a lot of people in this call who can talk about their publishing programs as they've evolved. I'm looking at you, UMass. Um, not that you're an entity, you are three people representing the University of Massachusetts. I had also invited Carla Myers from Miami University to talk a little bit about <clears throat> publishing there and how she's been um, getting the, the co-op off the ground and thinking through kind of how to structure the program. However, speaking of cold, she did just email me and say she has a frozen pipe, which um, I don't have a lot of experience with, but it seems like it's a touch and go situation. And so um, she may not be able to join us this time. Um, if not, she can join us at a, at a um, later meeting, but we're gonna play it by ear, so she may pop in. Um, we, if Carla can make it, we have a pretty packed agenda. And although the syllabus does say to allow for an hour today, we might go over a bit. Um, but of course, we are recording. So if you have to go, um, there will be uh, evidence of what you missed online. So um, let's start uh, just reviewing um, unit two, seeing what your takeaways were and if there are any questions or things that we can sort of collaboratively address. Then after that, I will turn things over to a new face who you may um, see in your Zoom setup, and that's David Allen Reck. He's the CEO and founder of Scribe. He's here to just talk a little bit about Scribe, give you some background, and answer any questions you may have about our partnership, how things work, publishing. Um, he, can, he can talk on, on myriad subjects. And then um, we'll talk a little bit more about manuscript requirements, agreements, and contracts. Again, I think there are many people in this call who can also lend their expertise um, to that topic. So um, now is the time when I turn it over to all of you and ask um, what your takeaways are. If some questions came up, um, if there are things left over from unit one, that's of course fine too, or other things that you're dealing with. But um, please share uh, a couple of takeaways or some questions from your homework. This is Emily. I thought this was um, really interesting. The MOU conversation, you know, brought up a lot of questions and ideas. So that was helpful thinking through just how to make sure your faculty author understands what CC BY really means on the front end. Um, I found all of that really helpful. I know in one part of the unit, there was this comment about thinking through which file format students prefer as a way to kind of plan your um, publishing. And so that was interesting to me. It was like a very small comment in the module but I thought, oh, I wonder what file formats students do prefer. I have um, expectations or assumptions about that, but I don't really know what file format students prefer. So I thought, you know, I'd be curious to see um, if others had ex experience on that or what you all have found in the first year of the cohort. Thanks, Emily. I, she, she, I, I talked a little bit too much last time, so I'm going to endure some, some additional silences this time. Because um, <clears throat> I know that some of you have this experience, as Emily said, just in terms of preferred file formats. Well, I'll jump in. My experience was talking to students anyway is whatever format is free is the best one <laughs> so I've never heard anyone uh, I, I did see that in there also but I I've never heard anyone say you know my students really prefer word doc so they can whatever or they prefer a PDF so 
uh, I haven't heard that. Um, there is the whole print versus digital conversation. And again, I think students, there may be students who have said, I learn better if it's in print, um, but they will also say, but if there's only a digital version and it's free, I will make do. So, and it seems to me that the students maybe have a preference, but it doesn't necessarily drive them as much as it does the faculty. So the faculty may say, oh, well, we, we need print. And that may or may not be based in reality or may not be as much of a priority for students. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. I'm gonna try a question for the group. So, <laughs> I broke. Um, so in terms of uh, projects and programs, how many of you feel like you're in a, in a project space where you're just kind of thinking about one particular project? How many of you feel like you may be sort of starting to pr predict or anticipate that transition to a program? I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, how you're thinking about your publishing initiatives at this stage or you know what there may have resonated with you and thinking about what you can provide um, for a project versus a program you want us to talk or chat what's the best one for this oh i like talking but it's, it's up to you guys yeah i, I mean I'm, I'm definitely still in the project mode but the whole idea of this going through this is to try to figure out what a program would look like. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm still, I still have to make sure that I have those two projects that I think I have, you know, to, mm -hmm. to work on. So, um, I admire those that have a program going. And so, Jeremy, Marilyn, or Madeline, can you maybe talk about um, mm -hmm. your program since you guys have been publishing for some time, um, maybe just a little sort of story or um, origin story about how you kind of got to where you are now and the things you've picked up along the way that may be useful to people who are kind of thinking more individually right now about projects rather than publishing programs. So um, I'll jump in here for a second and the others can pitch in obviously, but um, just thinking that uh, we started really small and it seemed like we were just doing little projects with um, some of our grants and it was in the same working space as with the institutional repository. So that was interesting, but yet it was flying off in diff different tangents. And then, you know, I was able to um, get Jeremy into the, into the fray of our open education. And uh, that's to me when, you know, when we had a dedicated person working on this uh, particular aspect of our whole scholarly communication um, program that we were able to start to think a little more programmatically. But yet on the same hand, I'm going to say that every single time we get faculty members who are interested in doing certain things that each one feels like a project but as we're um, as we're going along and becoming more and more knowledgeable about all the different aspects of publishing through the OTN through the library publishing coalition and some other work that we do it's it is starting to coalesce and so you know we've had the OTN I mean, the open education program in place since 2011. So it does take some patience and some longevity working through different <laughs> things to say, you know, these are the best practices that we need to have in place in order to really explain to the faculty what we have that we can um, offer them. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty comfortable that we're, that we're heading down that direction. <laughs> Yeah, and I would just add to what Marilyn said. It's what we have, I would think, is program-esque, meaning there are some projects that have don't necessarily have anything to do with publishing a textbook, you know, like we're talking about here. It might be just some OER-related thing. Uh, but the more projects we do that are sort of 
publication, um, textbook projects, the more it seems like that could, in theory, become its own separate program uh, because there's so much of it. You know, if it's sort of a one-off here and there, it could fit into our other sort of global OER program, but it may grow and say, if we're getting one a year, you know, we may say, okay, we need a kind of whole separate just focusing on publishing textbooks. But at the moment, we're sort of in between, I'd say. And I'll dovetail off what Jeremy just said. Um, and I think that some of the momentum that's carrying us forward right this minute that's leading us um, into a more programmat programmatic approach to this is having uh, received a statewide grant for doing open education, which is intending to broaden uh, awareness and capacity for developing OER throughout the state public higher ed sector. I don't know how many people ha are fortunate enough to have that kind of advantage ha start to happen, but it brought a lot of recognition to the program, what we've already done on the part of the chancellor and the provost, because all of the grants that we receive need to go through their offices as well for FYI purposes and uh, their approval. And it just now the um, Center for T uh, Faculty Development and Teaching Excellence has gotten much more interested in, well, how can they help really to make this more of a, an initiative that is a campus-wide initiative more than what it's been in the past. So I'm excited. I actually have some news from Michigan in the sense that um, so we have a, a, you know, Michigan was blank for OTN members, you know, until this year uh, or last year, technically. Um, and we don't have a cooperative like a lot of states, but we do have a sort of buying cooperative, the MCLS, which I forgot what it stands. It's mid, I don't know. It, it's Michigan and Indiana. And we just, um, a new director was announced, and he is someone who is definitely very interested in OERs. And so it might be through this cooperative that we could, um, con you know, further the conversation on a state level in Michigan. And, and you know, they're close to the Library of Michigan, and, and the Library of Michigan might be able to, to help. So hopefully. Yeah. It yeah, so. Um, we'll keep our fingers crossed, Myra. And listening to Jeremy and Marilyn, um, <clears throat> I just would like to highlight the point that, um, and, and this is in the curriculum too, that a, a lot of people will describe publishing support but feel that they're not engaged in publishing. They'll think of them more as sort of these one-off projects, but they do really, quite easily, I think, spin into programs. And before you know it, um, you're, you're sort of providing a service that you may not have realized you were going to provide or that you want to step back and think about whether you're really in a position to provide. Um, so this is just an opportunity to kind of, I think, flag that experience because I hear it a lot. And then also listening to them, um, I was just reminded, maybe Nathan, you would like to say something. Um, just thinking programmatically across the campus, Marilyn, you mentioned um, the Center for Teaching and Learning there, you know, wanting to get involved in the conversation with the library. And I know that at University of Northwestern St. Paul, you guys have already had some conversations across campus and that you're part of the cooperative kind of as a, a multi-unit thing. Yeah, um, we're the online learning office. That's what kind of the instructional design hub. We handle a lot of the non-traditional stuff. And this whole effort that we're doing with the Open Textbooks has been a partnership from the beginning with the library. Um, our dean is very much of an evangelist for Open, and so that has really helped shape the culture of our department, as well as she's been able to foster conversations across campus. So right now, you asked earlier about whether or not we feel like we're part of a program. I think right now, we're, this is just so new to us that we're just trying to get our feet wet and figure out how to do it right. And once we get it, how to do it right we can talk to other people and say well this is how this person did it and that'll help further some conversations but at this point uh, yeah but we're not really we'd love to have a program but we're not uh, mm -hmm. premature for us to say that sure okay <clears throat> did i interrupt somebody 
No, I just have, I have a question because we have instructional designers here, which is great. Um, okay, so I learned, um, I thought I knew what the roles were, but I didn't um, until I went to talk to our, we have a medieval um, institute publications press um, on campus and I went, and so um, she listed m most of the people that you have in your list of, of you know, who's involved. And one thing she didn't have is instructional designers because they don't publish textbooks. But so the, you know, um, so Scribe offers all of these, including instructional design help. Is that, that's my first question. Well, so maybe can that's I a good, answer that's that a good question <laughs> uh, when I talk in like the next two minutes? Okay, you'll answer that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, then for the instructional designers here in our group, um, do you charge to be part of this? I mean, this is always, you know, the question is going to come back on how do we pay for everything? And so if librarians contribute their piece of it for free, and we also have to make a good argument why we're doing this, you know, besides the greater good, um, and then so do instructional designers, can, they, can you guys be part of the team without um, being specifically billing someone for this service? Yeah. Uh, we, we're not charging extra to our library for our assistance. It's really much, very much partnership. It is something that um, it just, as I mentioned, our dean is very much an evangelist for open, and she has kind of, we have a way of calculating our capacity for how many courses we're able to work on in the semester, as well as um, maintaining courses in other projects, internal and external. And she asked us to factor some time into our load for this work, uh -huh. kind of how it happened. Now, not every instructional design shop has a way of measuring their capacity. Um, that's just something we're pretty good at, I think. Um, so, yeah. If I may make a comment about our experience in Hawaii, um, our best model among our community colleges uh, is when the vice chancellor um, for academics, the dean for academic support, or the vice chancellor for academic affairs, and then the dean for academic support uh, approached, um, the dean for academic support, support um, supervises both the library and the instructional design departments. So they bought, uh, they got on to OER, they instructed the unit heads for both, both uh, units to collaborate and create an OER program. Um, that's the, we have only one campus that was able to do that, and that campus has been the most effective. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And, and I'll add, you know, we just hired Mark Sheaves, a new community manager, and one of the areas of his um, engagement will be in working groups. And so we're really, we've been really excited about how we can engage instructional designers in the OTN around some of these questions. There's a ton of opportunity, particularly around the um, structuring of open textbooks, I think, for instructional designers um, to play a, a really valuable role and potentially make a big splash. And so, um, you know, if during the course of the cooperative and supporting one another, I think it's possible that there could, a guide could emerge, for example, or some other resource that the OTN would be very happy to, you know, share and amplify and it would really um, add a lot to what we're doing here. So those, those are opportunities that you see at the end of every unit in terms of, you know, what the community may need, identifying that need and then filling it. And, um, this, I'm just gonna say one more thing and then turn things over to David and then we can get back to any additional questions. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the feedback you've been giving at the end of the units. Just as an example, I did get a note about unit one that it could be helpful to offer more elaboration of what is meant by openers, closers, integrated pedagogic pedagogical devices. And so, you know, just even in terms of thinking out, fleshing out our curriculum too, um, if there's an instructional designer out there who has that kind of resource that we could openly license and share to give back, that would be really valuable. <clears throat> so 
Um, I asked David to join us um, at about a quarter after, and so I would like to turn things over to him now to address both the instructional design question in terms of what Scribe does and to talk about roles in publishing and answer any of your other questions. So David, thank you for coming and please take it away. Okay, well, excellent. Greetings, everyone. So uh, first of all, Nathan, by the way, if you figure out how to do it right, please call me whatever time, day or night that you need to do that. I'd appreciate it. Um, it my initial reaction was that, that and I mean this seriously, I don't mean this as a joke, which is that from our perspective, that's kind of a moving target. And what we're trying to do is create a program and a methodology based on a philosophy of doing it better and, each, and hopefully improving each time, but meeting the needs of the community that we're addressing. And I will explain a bunch of things, including what we or offer in terms of instructional design, which is very limited, and how Scribe works. Can you do me one favor, please, Karen, if you haven't? Actually, I think you've done it already. Did you make it so that I can? Yes. There we go. So very quickly, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna show you something which you're all aware of. And is also there are branches of this in, in Canvas that you all have access to. And there are videos of these things. But I'm going to refer to, doc whoops, I did not mean to do that one. I'm going to refer to documentation. And I presume, and if you can just nod your heads, that everyone's familiar with the documentation section of our website. Um, so I'm going to talk about sort of developing standards and approaches and documenting the things that you're going to do. There are a number of elements here. Uh, some of them are straight out, you know, this is how you use this tool. And others are more procedures for how to vet things, how to, you know, go from typesetting to ebook, how to create samples or specifications for how editorial is to be done, um, what we consider, for example, in Word for our spell checking settings, typesetting standards and the like, and also a series of resources. Um, most of these are in a, not applicable to you guys, but like how to best report corrections and alterations, how to process and manage images within your publications, um, conventions for typesetting, as well as a series of quality control checklists for every stage along the process that are here. So that, for example, if I'm doing a design, we have a series of checklists that we make sure that we follow. And these, these documents are dynamic in that whenever something comes up, we evaluate them and ask, are they covering everything, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to talk to you about certain kinds of standards like publishing standards or, you know, how you manage the production, et cetera. And my strong recommendation is that as you develop your program, you maintain lists like these. And these are all open, so you are welcome to use them. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to say before I stop sharing my screen is that if you have any questions as I am speaking, please just interrupt me because I am pretty familiar with what I'm about to say. So I think there's the inevitable question and a kind of you know implication. So you're all working as part of a university. You draw your, your salary from the university. And so if the university decides to do something in one way or another, um, then you, know, you are free. Are, is it? It's not, you're not seeing my screen any longer, correct? Seeing you. Pardon me? Correct. Okay, there's a bit of a, of a delay, so pardon me. So, um, so one thing I should mention before we go on, and I think everyone is familiar with this fact, is that Scribe is a private for-profit company that operates in the publishing space. Now, we started as a, as a uh, center for research at the University of Pennsylvania. So philosophically, we like to be open and we make as much as we can available on a kind of open source philosophy. 
But at the end of the day, we still need to pay Elvis's salary and Mike's salary. And occasionally I like to get paid as well. So, you know, when we perform services for you, we charge for those services. The one thing we tend to do, especially for OTN, is that if we perform a service, we will make it available then for others at no charge. We don't need to do what I affectionately refer to as double dipping. But I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood yes. that. And Scribe's role is in this is to collaborate with all of you to offer the technology that helps facilitate this, the programs, as well as offer services to you. Now, with respect to instructional design, um, we scribe does not we do not do instructional design per se. So if you come to us for that as a service, we don't offer that. What Scribe offers is what we call publication design. And we also offer the review and feedback process to assist to determine whether something is going to be effective. And I'm going to explain that to you as I explain our philosophy. So before I start, uh, I start everyone, is there any questions immediately or should I continue? Okay, no questions. All right, so just very quickly, um, what I'm having some computer issues, so hold on for one second, please. Just wanna start something up again real quickly as I'm Okay, well, my computer's bugging out, but I can do this off the top of my head. So you have all frozen for me. I presume that you can still hear me, correct, Karen? Yep, Dave. Okay, thanks. All right, so Scribe was started in 1993 to assist with publishing, and Scribe started predominantly as an extension of something called the Center for Computer Analysis of Text at the University of Pennsylvania. What we were doing is we were digitizing texts for humanities research and making them available to a network of universities that were sharing in this program. If any of you are familiar with the Perseus Project, we were contributors to that. In doing so, I became, and so did the rest of the people in the, at the center, experts in XML. And eventually we started helping out a number of electronic publishing initiatives. And then privately, as I developed Scribe, we moved upstream into the first typesetting and, and production side of things, and then eventually into editorial. And since 2001, Scribe has been offering what we refer to as full service publications development. Now, primarily, when we started doing the work, we were working for electronic. David, I think you cut out if you can still hear me. I think he'll be back shortly. <laughs> That's officially a technical difficulty. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, can I, um, can I do a test? Yeah. Is it, this is Kathy. You That's hear me? It's yep. Working. We can hear you and see you. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. So while we wait for David to come back on, and hello, Adam. Glad you could uh, join us. Oh, and David's back. We see you, David, but, but we don't know if we can hear you yet. My apologies. Okay. I take it I am back. You are, great. Okay, excellent, my apologies for that. Anyway, so um, what happened was is that from 1993 to roughly 2004, 
we were supplying publishers like Elsevier and Lippincott Williams and Wilkins and uh, it's what is now Cengage and Macmillan and McGraw Hill with various services to help them produce their textbooks. And as that was moving on, we noticed a trend starting and by 2004 had kind of come to f full fruition, which was that publishers were relying more and more on outsourcing, especially to Indian vendors who now, as you all know, control the market for editorial and production services throughout the publishing industry, but especially in textbook publishing. And so what they were doing was that they were basically just looking at cost benefit analysis and they were sending out things as cheaply as they could. And as that was going on, there was a trend which you're all familiar with and the reason why we're here, which was that there were a variety of factors going on, but essentially textbooks became less and less profitable. And as they became less and less profitable, they then spent less and less producing them. And they also had this issue where they were losing revenue because the secondary market opened up, used bookstores, electronic, et cetera, et cetera, pirating, you name it, there's a host of things. And so that led to a kind of vicious cycle in which the publications of textbooks became more and more what we referred to as commoditized. And the problem with commoditization is that not only does the quality go down, but it becomes less and less connected to the reality of the situation. Um, and what ended up happening, if you're familiar with, for example, the p and the profits and losses for any of the large publishers like Cengage and Macmillan, et cetera, their profits are down. In fact, the large publishers have all lost money over the last three years. Um, and that, of course, affects everyone, the authors who write the book, the publishers themselves, the students, and the institution. Um, and this became more and more problematic, and it also created a situation where several things happened. And, and this speaks to the instructional design directly. Number one, um, they had less and less budget for doing review process for developing publications in a, what I would refer to as a dynamic way, that is, with respect to the student. Um, and because they were engaged in a kind of false edition output, that is, it wasn't really an organic reason for producing new editions. Rather, what had happened was is that they knew that they had to create new editions to maintain a sales cycle. Publishers started to do things like design by what I refer to as committee or add features just for the sake of features without paying attention to the pedagogical value of those features. Um, they lost complete kind of connection with the people who were using the books like students and started catering strictly to adoption purposes and making the books, frankly, less and less relevant to the students, more and more expensive to the students, and making them, for in some cases, much and much easier for the large adoptions to occur by offering supplemental components like study guides, test banks, um, PowerPoints, et cetera, for the textbooks. This increased the expense and reduced the payment to everyone. And the payment doesn't really matter to anyone, but what it essentially did was it denigrated the value and the usefulness of textbooks. And so that's where we are right now. And the reason I mention that is not to say anything bad about the publishing industry or to um, make any comments about open textbook, because I have no idea whether that's going to be successful or not. But as a kind of warning, when we're thinking about instructional design, when we're thinking about producing textbooks, when we're thinking about the kind of standards and the kinds of methodologies like engaging freelance P 
people to do work or even engaging a company like Scribe to do work, that we should be thinking about these things in a particular way. Once again, you all have frozen on my screen. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Hear okay. So um, basically, we're in a position now where, you know, in with traditional, what I, I would refer to as status quo textbook development, all of the interested parties, that is the author, the publisher, the student, and the institution are being damaged and not being, uh, not being assisted by the textbook, which is supposed to help in pedagogy and educate students. Um, the worst part is that the textbook publishers have now become completely disconnected from the subject matter and the information that would be necessary to make for good pedagogy. So just a quick sidebar, three quick sidebars actually. Sidebar number one is, so when I mentioned that Scribe does not do instructional design, what we mean by that is that we don't design textbooks based on principles of instructional capacity or we don't come up with the pedagogical framework that a textbook would employ in order to meet the needs of the subject. We do that in conference with the author. And what we come up with is a textbook design, as an example, that has the elements that are necessary. And we will provide an architecture for that. That is, here are the elements. Here's the way they're going to be presented. Here are some things to avoid pedagogically. Um, for example, tables are often very useless and they're very difficult to comprehend, but often people want to employ them. So we'll help frame a design and an architecture that is comprehensible and meets the needs of the publication, if that makes sense. And that's a different kind of activity than merely coming up, and, and I don't mean to denigrate it, but merely coming up with, for example, a pedagogical plan. Um, our methodology says that there should be a dialectic relationship between the author and the student, and that what we as publishing professionals are doing is curating that relationship and providing comprehensible textbook materials, be they in print or electronic, to do so. Um, by the way, so in that vein, the other sidebar that I want to just quickly do is the issue of when you're hiring professional copy editors or production people. Um, one of the things that we will very strongly recommend is that if you're hiring people, you try to create a consistency in the copy editing that you're doing that is what we call imprint identity. And I will explain that in a few minutes. The same thing with production people and that you create a feedback loop with your copy editors in terms of how things are going so that when you are engaged in what you're doing, what you're doing is you're creating a situation where the copy editors or the production people that you're engaging are part of that dialectic process. Now, typically that's not what happens. Typically what happens is you go to a copy editor and you say, hey, I have this manuscript and I need it copy edited, and you send it off to that person, and that person will then perform his or her copy editing without reference to the author, the material, or the person who's reading it, and basically following a style guide or some kind of, of standard that either you've provided or they've come up with, they will apply what they perceive to be the real rules of grammar and the proper interference with that document, and then they will hand it back to you. And often, you'll only engage that person for one stage, and you'll take other steps, and that copy editor will not see that ever again. And one of the things we are suggesting is that you don't engage in those kinds of practices. David, um, so, I'm gonna interrupt. Go I just wanna give a little bit of framework for what you're saying and just um, take a step back because we're pretty early on in our um, 
in our orientation here. And so what David is describing is kind of um, one of the key elements of flexibility within the cooperative. So you could, for example, choose to uh, copy edit a textbook manuscript within the library. Say there's someone there with copy editing expertise. That's your choice. Um, and David is making some recommendations in that scenario or in a scenario where perhaps you find someone freelance, um, which is common in publishing programs. And then another option you have in the co-op would be to use Scribe for copy editing. So Scribe, of course, has a staff of professionals who can provide those different publishing roles that were covered in Unit 2, but it's not a requirement of being in the co-op. You could decide, you know, because of the resources you have at your institution, you're going to go a different way, collaborate with a, someone at the university press, for example. But um, David's recommendations are just sort of within that framework. I wanted to point that out since we haven't really gotten into the nitty gritty of, you know, who's going to copy edit, who's going to proofread, that kind of thing. <clears throat> right. And, and thanks for that, Karen. The, the one thing I should mention is so, so I was intentionally um, being uh, vague and possibly confusing in, in my presentation on that because I wanted to give you a slightly different model and then elaborate that. So, so, um, so thanks for that absolutely perfect introduction. Um, so, so let me explain a kind of theory that we've been developing as well as an approach that we think is a, a, a non-commoditized, financially, fiscally responsible, as well as as schedule responsible methodology for producing textbooks, as well as publications in a sort of general sense. Um, and, and, and I have to, I have to uh, mention something that I've discovered in, in like the last two weeks in both preparation for this, as well as in terms of a kind of model that employs this. I'll send an email to Karen, she can send this off to everyone, but I recently discovered something called Callisto Media. They exist both in New York and in the Bay Area, and um, it's C-A-L-L-I-S-T-O media.com. And basically what they are doing is a data-driven, unfortunately not so human version of what I am about to explain. So if you're interested in the sort of a more technical, theoretical uh, underpinning for what I'm about to explain, there's a place to go. So quick story, Scribe from 2004 started noticing that we were losing business in certain sectors and eventually in a number of sectors and, and that business was being shipped off to India. And we tried a number of experiments and eventually landed on uh, an idea that thankfully has led to some greater success since 2015 for our company, which is essentially this. Publishing, when we talk about traditional publishing, be it textbook publishing, be it trade publishing, academic publishing, what happens is, is that over the years from 19... 48 roughly to uh, roughly 1999, what we had was an ever increased, essentially, creation of what I refer to as an anonymous transaction with respect to publishing. That is, publishers in the past, say from the 13th century, when we have our first professional publishers emerging, all the way through to the beginning of World War I, what they were doing is they were engaged in an activity in which they directly connected authors to their readers. Uh, the most famous and kind of common example of this is the Charles Dickens publications, which were published serialized, and then he would get lots of people responding to him and his editor, and he would collaborate to to refine the next chapter. And as things moved on, it was a complete dialectic relationship between him and his audience. Um, what happened was first Barnes and Noble, now Amazon, publications became anonymous and, and the customer was no longer the person reading the book. The customer was the person was Amazon or some large chain. And what that led to was a divorce 
and a decline in publication. Number one is becoming commoditized. People spent less money on the editorial and production. The quality went down. Their relevance went down. The willingness of people to spend money on those things was down because they didn't value it, et cetera, et cetera. For university presses and for textbook publications, this led to both decreased revenue as well as worse and worse publications. Um, one of the reasons why the library publishing services had emerged is because essentially what happened was is that many of the university presses actually just became kind of redundant and not particularly useful to its audience. As that was developing, Scribe noticed something, which is that there was a different approach that one could take to publishing. What we now refer to as mission-driven publishing, and hopefully you will become sort of part of that philosophy, that what ended up happening was is that publishers started to emerge that instead of the publication being an entity unto itself, the publication was an attempt to extend the mission of an organization, be that a professional organization, uh, many churches engage in this, or university and, and colleges. And amongst some of the AUP, the American University, the Association of University Presses, excuse me, members, as well as the LPC, um, there are a number of organizations that I would define as mission driven. That is, that mission driven assumes a tradition of publishing whereby the activities that they're engaged in is, a, is an attempt to reach the community and develop a dialectic relationship with a group of people as they develop an understanding of the subject that publications that are trying to reach them or conditions that change their ability to synthesize information becomes apparent to those who are producing the materials. And what we feel that as a philosophy for your approach is that you should be engaged in what we refer to as mission driven publishing and that it should be a that you should strive to develop a standard but that that standard be dynamic in that it can be continuously adjusted as you learn more and more things thus the doing it better each time kind of thing as well as recognizing that publishing is an act of curating and so things like, as an example, instructional design or certain kinds of other elements of publishing, we suggest that those kinds of things be brought into the community. Um, and, and obviously, what we're hoping to do is that we're hoping to help you develop what we refer to as imprint identity. That is, an identifiable publication or series of publications, even if those textbooks are re-edited and, and reproduced, that has pedagogic editorial production consistency, but also is very strongly connected to the community in which those publications take place. And so that you would engage, for example, students and professors and authors in doing that. Now, in order to do that from a practical standpoint, because that's all very highfalutin and, and philosophical, um, in order to do that, we suggest certain kinds of general approaches. Um, number one, of course, Scribe believes very strongly in the well-formed document workflow, that if you're going to create dynamic, dialectic, consistent publications, what you need is a consistent markup or nomenclature, um, not merely some kind of XML standard that's, that's applied in an inconsistent fashion, but instead a rigorous application of standards across all of your publications. And I would even argue, as, as I guess the OTN has, has accepted, a rigorous standard across the entire network. Um, obviously, the scribe markup language provides that, and it's readily available whether someone's engaged in the well-formed document workflow or not. 
Um, the second point that we would tend to make is the notion of a consistent but dynamic set of editorial production standards that include guidelines for authors, templates for how you're working, documenting everything that you do, including that consistent markup, but also um, very high production value for both print and electronic. I would love to add, and I think everyone here agrees, that also publications should, if they're electronic, should all be fully accessible and meet accessibility requirements in that consistent production standard. Um, not a specific plug for Scribe, but anything that goes through our system meets the minimal standards and allows for the larger standards in accessibility. Um, then to the specifics of, of editing, what we feel is, is that um, editing should be done in an appropriate, adaptive, and, product, and professional setting. So we actually recommend that you find someone within your community. Obviously, Karen mentioned that there are varieties of different ways of going about it. But we recommend that you find someone within your community with whom you can develop a long-standing relationship um, to perform editorial work and that you don't merely hire that person to perform a task. You involve that person in your or people in your entire publication programs. Um, I've been testing this for a really long time and we have a whole method at our company for making sure that once a copy editor copy edits a book, that she gets the response from the author and response from the publisher or the response from the community back to her in order to understand how to better improve her craft and future publications that we have. Um, the next, someone has a question. Yeah, I'm gonna add to that again too and also just <clears throat> um, pause and see if anyone has any questions about what you said so far, but um, what David is describing is one reason why we have made um, these orientations open to as many people at your organization as who want to attend so that they can have the holistic picture about the publishing process, um, how it works, and to understand, you know, what happens early on all the way through to publication. And then I've said this before, but um, it's worth repeating that one of, one of the things that brought us to Scribe were conversations with university presses and other publishers, you know, asking them about partnerships. And they said, well, we'd be happy to partner with you, but you should talk to Scribe directly because that's who provides many of these services for us. And so um, when I talked to David and talked about the OTN's mission and um, that everything, you know, would be licensed openly, he was very, I don't want to put emotions into your heart, David, but uh, I think he was excited and open to, you know, experimenting with this cooperative model for the reasons he's been talking about, because um, he believes in the dialectical relationship between author and reader, and because that's a lot of what we're doing here in terms of really providing um, a more direct or more intimate communication between um, faculty authors and their students rather than someone who's you know a million miles away just kind of creating something that may be um, less tailored to specific student populations. I mean everyone in this call has a very different campus culture, um, a different student body, different you know mission vision values and so you know within this context we can um, really support those those in uh, unique ways. So are there questions for David, things that he's mentioned so far that you would like to clarify? Um, I know, you know, we, the unit talked about imprint and brand. And so that's something, you know, as you're working on projects and potentially uh, transitioning to a program, that's kind of something to keep in the back of your mind, I think, in terms of the look and feel and how it reflects your campus culture and branding. Um, <clears throat> and so maybe, David, that's kind of where you're going, but I just wanted to check in with everybody. No questions so far? Okay, I only have oh, a few no. more points, and I'm oh, going to... One. Oh, okay. 
No, I don't, I'll have a question later about imprint. You know, I just was, um, is, is anybody doing an OER type of imprint? You know, I, I'm struggling with what we're going to be. I mean, do we put down just Western Michigan University or is it university libraries or is it university OER initiative? You know, who, what's the, how do you imprint? How do you make that? I think it's a great conversation to have internally with your leadership, with any partners you have to kind of think about how you may frame it. What are some other thoughts? Has anyone started working on sort of the imprint brand question? Marilyn? Oh, I wasn't going to go there, so I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask another question. Kathy? Okay, could I just say one thing about imprint identity before we go on? So um, very often, and I, I just don't know the mindset of everyone on this call, but but I sit in on a lot of meetings with, with you know, so-called professional publishers, what I refer to as status quo publishers. And whenever they talk about imprint identity, what they're talking about is, is you know, what, what name are we putting on this? Are we going to print this through this division or this division? And, and it's always about sales. Um, imprint identity, is the, the original publishers that we're familiar with that started kind of brand identification or imprint identity. The real identity wasn't so much the logo on the spine or the name of the publisher. Um, it was actually the editorial standards by which they operated and that the people who were buying the book understood both intuitively as well as explicitly what they were getting each time. You know, so like it, it, when you talk about, say, for example, campus culture, one of the things that we would talk about is that I have had the, the honor of being part of a number of academic institutions. And each one of them, in addition to having a sort of culture and everything else, or I guess part of the culture, is that there's a sort of campus vocabulary, campus set of ideas, campus set of pedagogical methods that work better there than, for example, in another institution. And what I would hope that you do as you're considering imprint identity is not worry so much about what the logo is or what name gets placed on the title page or the half title page or in the copyright section, but think about how does this reflect the culture and pedagogy and vocabulary and what I would refer to as rhetorical method of my institution. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry to be, you know, but that's going to, Marilyn, I think you had a question. I cut you off. No, that's quite fine. I'm not going to forget it. Um, so one of the things that I've been thinking about as um, we move forward with this and trying to figure out how to best potentially work with our university press and also engage with our student population with regard to some of these possible editorial functions is we have a, a superb uh, technical writing program here at the university and I was just um, I pondered but I haven't approached this yet to see if there was some interest in engaging with that particular group as um, giving them experience with the editorial process, but then also very cautious about that in some other ways, because I hear what you're saying about this, you know, buying into the entire process and being part of your entire culture, but that also could be positive for the students um, as up and coming writers. Uh, our technical writing program is basically 100% hiring out the students as soon as they graduate. So there is a high quality of final graduates that come out of that program. So anyway, just thinking of other potential partners within academe that could work with us as we want to be more programmatic about our um, publishing services. So what your thoughts might be. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else has an answer to that. I do not know yet. I was smiling because on, I can't even remember the date, I think it was the 21st of February, I'm going to be on the campus at University of Central Florida. Um, we're trying to recruit directly from them to hire new scribe employees. 
but we're actually going to try an experiment with respect to copy editing, which is along the lines of what you just suggested. They have a uh, they they have a different name for it, but it's essentially a technical writing program as well. So I'll let you know how that goes. I'm always worried because students disappear at critical moments. Kathy, did you have a question or comment that you wanted to add? Sorry, am I muted or not muted? You're not muted anymore, but okay. Kathy, it looks I am. I, okay, can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say about imprint, um, I was discussing, I had sent it out to the listserv and I got, uh, because the University of Connecticut does not have a press. We don't have any publishing, uh, as far as I know, except for the document production that copies things for people. And so um, with the agreement with OTN, we're supposed to have our own imprint and we'll put it, you know, that this, the author has the copyright and here's our imprint and this is published through OTN. And I'm thinking, hmm, um, uh, do we even have the um, right or is it, uh, well, anyway, the, what happened was with this wonderful um, email I got back from a very knowledgeable person in Michigan, but I can't remember his name. He mentioned that I probably sh should go pass this to the general counsel in our in on our campus because we don't have any kind of publishing. We can't all of a sudden put University of Connecticut Publishing down without actually, uh, you know, getting the the uppers uh, to know about it and to 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 bless it. So that was our problem. I mean, that's the problem we have right now. And luckily, our someone in our administration here at the library is on the general counsel's committee for copyright and so forth and she's going to take that forward um, because i'd hate surprises you know i'd hate to find out after all i do all this work oh you can't do that you know so um that you never know about it so just with your own institutions make sure uh just make sure you run it by somebody that this is what you're going to do and what uh you know i'm not talking about the design but make sure you have their backing for it Great comment. Thank you, Kathy. Right. So could I just jump in because I know we're running out of time and I just wanted to finish a few points. So, um, you know, as you're thinking about these things, the idea of creating a well-formed document or some, you know, consistent marked up material where you have a, an agreed upon consistently applied nomenclature, the idea of maintaining strong uh, and consistent production standards, the same thing with a developing an adaptive but an appropriate but professional editing process. The other things that we would strongly recommend that you pay attention to is uh, you should have a policy and standards for author management. Um, what you communicate to the author, what your allowances are with respect to the authors, um, that you contain them, and that you use their, their lack of professional knowledge uh, as an asset, not a liability. So, you know, try and talk them down from doing things that are not pedagogically useful. Try and make sure that they don't run away with alterations and corrections and things like that, and make sure they're aware of your expectations and what the standards by which you're publishing are. Um, the other thing is, and this is a given, I, I assume, with libraries, but, you know, since you're in direct contact with the people who are accessing these materials there we feel there should be like a really strong set of pedagogic standards established for each publication as a kind of mission statement or as a kind of specification for publication however you want to refer to it and that that there be a feedback methodology as part of all of your programs that is the students who are using the textbooks should be consulted in a real way. You know, they should be providing feedback. They should let you know what was effective about these things. Um, it, I know that it's, it's typical that students will do evaluations at the end of their semester for the course, and they'll give, you know, a rating for professors and everything else like that. In my experience, those are sort of just pro forma and, and very rarely is there actual feedback or analysis performed. What we would suggest is that you 
have a method to continuously improve your publications program. Um, that's basically it in terms of that in, and recognizing, of course, that the publication, while it needs to be fiscally responsible and you need to get it out on time, so you need to be schedulely responsible, it's also an extension of the education process and not merely an entity unto itself. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Sorry for jumping in and finishing that real quickly, but I figured I would make sure that I said something about the authors and managing them. Yeah, and that, that'll be a nice um, thing to keep in mind. That's our unit three that we'll he we're heading into next week. Author management is a huge part of um, <clears throat> what we're covering throughout the orientation. And um, I would like to invite any other questions for David. Uh, I think we got a nice sort of overview of the publishing industry uh, historically and more recently um, in a sense of <clears throat> you know what what we're doing here together in the scribe OTN partnership um, Sunny yes thanks um, I was uh, took a lot of notes on, on uh, the history of publishing I found it fascinating and I have one note that leaves me puzzled it was I think you were talking it was earlier in the talk and you were talking about um, uh, publishers having um, less funding for quality control and then the whole uh, the uh, process of de uh, starting the false edition phenomenon and somewhere I mean here in my notes I say that payments were starting to denigrate the usefulness and value of textbooks and I wasn't clear what did you mean payments to the authors or or no what I meant is the revenue stream entirely on publish on publishing textbooks Okay. Um, obviously, the authors, the authors feel that in that since they are paid on a royalty basis, typically they're earning, you know, less and less money mm -hmm. on on textbooks. But what I meant was, so because the return on investment keeps getting lower and lower per textbook, what ends up happening is is that in order to make the P and L work, um, one thing I should know. So every publisher when they go to produce a book, I assume everyone knows that they produce a profit and loss statement in advance mm -hmm. of their work. And it's a complete work of fiction because who knows what your profits are going to be um, when they're doing that. But what they do is they allocate a certain amount of money for each line. And as their revenues got crunched, what they were doing is they were reducing on a line by line basis the amount of money that they were willing to spend, for example, on developmental editing, on okay. the review process, on professional review, on copy editing, on production, that being typesetting. Um, and so what ended up happening is, is that that led to sort of, you know, cyclical process of denigrating publications entirely. Okay. The production value, for example, open up any Cengage publication not to pick on them they just happen to be the largest. And you can see there's a degradation of, of the work that they're doing. Paper so, quality is mm -hmm. a good example. So two quick questions, because I know we're out of time. Um, um, you, you're probably familiar with that famous chart which shows the inflation rate of textbook costs in comparison yeah. to housing and health costs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And most people, including me, when we look at that, we're going, oh, well, wow, they're profiting <laughs> tremendous amounts of money. Um, how does that sync up with um, the, the, the troubles that you're describing that the publishing industry is in? And, and the second question is, I've, I've heard conversations where they're saying, well, the average um, amount of loyalty, uh, royalty income that a, a textbook author can expect is maybe $5,000 a year if they're lucky. Is that true or because uh, faculty will come to me and they're trying to figure out um, if they took it to a commercial publisher, what would it be worth for them for, you know, for reti their retirement planning, obviously. Um, can you give some insight on that? Well, uh, I can't give you insight on the, how much the author payments are. I will tell you this. Um, so there's the TAA, the Textbook and Academic Author Association. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. And um, it's TAA.org, I believe. 
you know, as I'm speaking to you, I will go on my computer and I will look up uh, uh, well, I'll look it up. Too many you can find it. Days. Yeah, we can we'll find it up. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's called the Textbook and Academic Authors Association. It's it's taaonline.net. Thank you. Anyway, so they at their conference they invite people to report on these things, and I I, I would. So my first response when an author asks me about royalties is that I make the joke that a good friend of mine in the publishing industry named Paul Dry makes, which is he told me he started out as a as a, an investment banker and opened up a publishing house and we were at lunch and he says, so Dave, you know how to make a small fortune in publishing? And I'm sure you all have heard this. I had not heard this joke. And he said, well, you need to start with a large one. And then I remind authors that very rarely do they actually make money on these things. There are a few textbook authors that have, you know, large publications that make them decent amounts of money. But by and large, textbook authors are not making money on their publications. And by and large, they have a full-time job, the university, which pays them a pretty good salary. And, you know, they're set for life once they're tenured. So, you know, to me, I'm not sure why they care about a few thousand bucks. So now I've been dismissing that. The problem is this. Textbook authors do not make money on royalties. The rare bird does, but by and large, they do not. Mm -hmm. The reason they should be creating a textbook is because they are, you know, completely ensconced in the community and the discipline. And what they want to do is produce a better way to make that discipline that they're part of accessible to their students and to other students who are, you know, of similar training and in the same vein. That, that is why they should be producing textbooks. If they're looking for money, send them out of your office and tell them they're wasting your time. And I'm not trying to be a smart aleck about that, but, but that's sort of my response to them. Um, and they should be doing it you know, I, I don't mean to be overly idealistic, but they should be doing it for those reasons. Now, to answer the first question, and this is very important, not as a t subject on itself, but in terms of the way you all are thinking about these things. So what happened over time is that the second, there, there became no secondary mark, no way of selling a book on a continuous basis. If I put a textbook out, and I have a thousand students adopting that textbook, you know, or buying that textbook because there's one course adoption this semester. As soon as the semester is over, the vast majority of those students is going to go back to their bookstore or go to Amazon or go someplace else, and they are going to sell back that book. And mm -hmm. that book is then going to become part of the secondary sales market. What happens there is that other people, whoever those textbook sellers are or renters or whom, whoever they are, those people are now generating the revenue on the book, but no additional revenue is going back to the publisher. And so the publisher has had to, inc well, I would argue there would have been a different path, but within that model, the publisher then has to increase the cost of the first run of that book because they can only realize their expenses out of the first buy of publication, right? Mm -hmm. And so okay. you're correct. You watch the, the costs go up because the first essentially printing or run or adoption or whatever you want to call that mm -hmm. of that edition has to foot the bill on the entire editorial and production costs, mm -hmm. where before they had continuing revenue and you could get backlist re revenue from your publications. Nowadays, they don't have that option. Okay. The other thing is Amazon can simply buy the book at their discounted rate, which is like 50% of the cost, and then rent it out to students, mm. which is what they're doing. And so the publisher is only getting half the revenue in that case. Although, you know, a bookstore takes half, et cetera, et cetera. So it may not degrade their revenue that much. You get that idea. Yes. And so as you're thinking about books and editions and things, so that creates a false market for revised editions because once you can no longer 
recognize the revenue from the first printing, then the only way to gain additional revenue out of that title is to reissue it with as a new edition and to add features or whatever they call that, um, which doesn't necessarily make the book more pedagogically useful, right? Okay. So, you know, one of the things, just as an example, and pardon me if I'm ran rambling a little bit, but like in terms of editions, as you're thinking in OTN, the only reason you need a new edition of a book is if new research or new pedagogical methodology develops that renders that material no longer useful, mm -hmm. right? And of course, you're now in an open environment, so someone can revise a book to their own usefulness, so it's a different issue. But those kinds of considerations get changed if you're publishing in a more organic methodology. Mm. And, you know, I think, Karen, what is it, 8,000? How much were you guys suggesting that authors get paid for? 5,000. How much? 5,000. 5,000. Yeah, as a, as a joke, when we, when we first started speaking it to Karen, I was, I was, I spoke at the TAA a couple years ago, and I was I was taken out to lunch afterwards by uh, the president and the the person who organizes the organization. And I mentioned like you know Karen was struggling with it, and I I was like I don't know what the number would be, and I said well what if it were five thousand dollars? And they both said well if you gave five thousand dollars to every member of the TAA for the book that they wrote, they'd all be exceedingly happy except for the one guy who's making, you know, 20 grand a year on his book. Uh, I remember that anecdote. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Sunny. Are there other questions for David before he goes? I'll just add one thing about the comment about the, that chart that Sunny referred to is about the prices as I understand it anyway, the individual price is not the profits of the industry. So as I understand what David's saying, as profits may have been going down, they were increasing prices. Mm -hmm. right. is that, would you, that be accurate, David? Yeah, in fact, both Macmillan and Cengage. Now, there's a little voodoo in book publishing accounting. So you take this with a grain of salt, please. But both Cengage and Macmillan for the last two years in a row have posted losses. Mm -hmm. Although I met the president of um, Macmillan UK on a sailing trip and he had, uh, I think it was a 39 foot Bristol. And I don't know if any of you are sailors, but a 39 foot Bristol is a pretty sweet boat. So I'm not sure they're really suffering. Well, thank you, David. It's great to um, get the inside scoop from you, and we appreciate your time, <clears throat> and uh, we appreciate Elvis and Mike being here with us uh, on a weekly basis for the next several weeks, so thank you. And thank you, and thanks to Mike and, and Elvis, and everyone has my email address and my phone number. You're more than welcome to reach out to me, though. Both Elvis and Mike are far more competent in their expertise than I am. All right. Well, I'm going to um, just make a few closing comments and, and housekeeping remarks. And if in the meantime, you um, anyone here has something to add or questions, let me know. So um, Carla was able to join us ever so briefly. And then she said the plumber pulled into her driveway. So now she's gone again. Um, but we should uh, be able to welcome her next week when she will join Kathy. Um, we're going to be talking about some uh, project management uh, skills, things they've both learned as they've um, moved through the process and where they are so far. Uh, Carla is also a, a journal editor, and so she has some other um, stories to share in terms of giving um, manuscript requirements um, to authors and really trying to um, lay out expectations early on, both in contracts and in early training. Um, so she can talk a bit about that. Um, I see, hold on, the chat is flashing. 
Um, oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Um, so Kathy will be there too. And um, if you haven't yet given feedback on the units, there's that little Google form at the end of every unit. It's very mm -hmm. valuable. I am reading it and I appreciate your comments. Um, <clears throat> Now, just a, a moment before we get to unit three, you'll see a lot of stuff on vetting. And so I wanted to invite Elvis to just kind of give you some um, foundational things to keep in mind as you read about vetting so that it's not too overwhelming because it visually is a little overwhelming. Right. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, so when we think, when we talk about vetting, what we're really saying is that you're taking a look at the document before you actually start the work. Oftentimes there's this initial vet uh, where a lot of stuff goes on and you'll see in that module that we have vetting for pretty much everything. Um, and the reason for this is because we want to try to catch as many things as possible in the beginning rather than leave things and say, well, yeah, sure, here you have this, you know, this manuscript and you can just start, let's say, copy editing. Without vetting, you don't know the level of editing that that will need, um, whether you know, the author, for example, plagiarized a whole section of the book. Um, that's, that's actually happened. We've caught that in vetting, and we've had to go back and say, wait a second, you actually have to give credit for this and this other stuff. So uh, when you look at this information on vetting, it's going to seem overwhelming just because there's so much of it. But realize that um, for one, it's not like a thing that you have to sit down and do in like one day and say like, oh, I have to go through this manuscript and look at each and everything here. We've provided certain questions that you can ask um, yourself or the author or the people who are going to be working on it to better give you answers for, um, uh, for you know, just those questions on vetting. And also, when you think about uh, just the idea of vetting, all you need to really think about is like, I'm looking at this and I'm trying to catch things that I foresee. Um, and sometimes it's even best to say like, you're not the best editorial person or you know nothing of typesetting or anything like that. It might be best to have somebody on your team um, or even ask us, hey, could you look at this and tell me, do you see anything weird uh, or anything that might you know create an issue later on. So again, you're going to read in, um, in unit three about betting, but do not be uh, afraid. It is a lot. It seems like a mountain of, of, of information. You don't have to read through every little tidbit of vetting spec uh, of the vetting spec that's up there. Um, you'll notice that when David um, looked at, uh, at our documentation site, there is actually an entire vetting spec in there where uh, that sort of mirrors what's up there on the Canvas site. Um, so you have those as resources and you're welcome to look at them, but do not feel obligated to sit there and read every question and wonder now, like, how am I going to answer this? Because you might not even know what, like, you know, what this means or this other thing. Means. We're going to talk more about it. Um, and when we get to that project management um, module class, um, well, whatever you'd like to call it, we'll talk more about specifics and things that really you should look for and things that you can say, okay, let me hand that off to somebody else uh, to look at because they'll know better, uh, better than I. Um, so I hope hopefully that um, calms people down just because uh, <laughs> Karen had noted it, that it is a lot and it is a lot that we look at, but you'll see that it's well worth it. As I said in the, in the class, previous class, it's better to front load things and get things out of the way early and avoid surprises down the end, which down the end of the line, which can become quite big issues. So, yeah. And so I'll and give it back to Karen. Thank you, Elvis. Um, and that actually vetting is something you might want to ask Karen Bjork about at Tea Time on Monday. Um, just a reminder, this Tea Time will be special. We're going to celebrate the first co-op publication. And so I've prepared some questions for Karen. I invite you to bring your own. We will record this Tea Time, which is unusual. Um, just so that we can share the story of her um, co-op publishing experience, especially since it's the first one. Um, so I hope that you can join us on Monday. Um, and then we will meet again Wednesday following, well, first we're going to go to the Library Publishing Coalition webinar. I think all of you have registered for that. Um, if not, please do. That's hosted by the LPC. And so um, you need to sign up with them. The link is in the syllabus if you haven't yet. Um, and Carla, Karen, and I will be hosting um, more about the co-op there. And then we'll um, 
join our class much like we did last week for the second hour to um, talk about project management hear from um, Kathy and Carla it's going to be another action-packed session um, we're not going to cover everything in project management in that hour we're really covering it throughout the orientation um, for example at the top of the hour today you heard how important it is to educate authors on the open licenses I will say that that comes up time and again that project managers and authors think they have an understanding and then they see a couple chapters and it's like, wait a minute, this, this, this does not reflect an understanding of open licenses. So that's a pretty big snag that I frequently hear about so that you may want to put in your pocket. And then the other one really is contracts. Um, in unit two, you probably noticed the Creative Commons contract that Meredith Jacob drafted. It's a really, really good jumping off point. You're going to want to have some kind of contract that probably your general counsel or someone else has looked at at your institution um, to be sure that you've signed off on it. And really as a way to just clarify um, what you're both doing, what you expect will come out of it, what your roles are. Um, there's nothing like a contract and asking someone to sign something to really help um, everybody's role kind of gel and to, and to ask questions like, well, what does this mean? What do you, what do you mean I'm gonna do this part? Well, who's gonna do that part? Um, it's really an opportunity. So I, I highlight those as a couple takeaways from, um, from unit two. So before we go, I just wanna check in one last time, see if there's anything um, we didn't cover. Maybe you'd like us to dedicate some time to it in a future session or other questions and concerns. Myra? I just had a small one about the, you know, the diversity equity piece, you know, so I feel like I now have an excuse for the amount of time I spend with this one Ethiopian professor that just has a totally different cultural standard on how things get done, you know, and it's, it's been, um, it's been very time consuming to work with. I've been working with him on a journal, not, not a book, but, mm -hmm. but so the, this equity piece gave me a, <laughs> uh, gave me a reason to, to, you know, for excuse for spending that much time. <laughs> but it was interesting. I mean, there, there's a lot of things to be considered under that whole diversity equity. Yeah, and there's a lot that I think the people who work in publishing are still um, moving towards in, in terms of figuring out how to offer programs that um, are equitable and that reflect, you know, diversity and authorship. Um, and diversity in context. Um, so I think there's a lot, you know, that we're going to continue to develop as a publishing community in that space, but that we all share a commitment and awareness to um, improving um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in what we're publishing. Does yeah. anyone else have um, comments they'd like to make on that or examples, anything they've seen that they think is like a good example, perhaps? One thing it just makes me think of is um, within the open textbook library, I know there's that rubric that faculty use for their review and one element of the um, rubric has like a cultural relevancy element to it. And so I think um, I know there was a, a rubric for proposals in this section and I didn't or maybe one that was referenced to I didn't, I didn't look at it. But it made me think about including something like that cultural ref relevancy, um, diversity and inclusion piece in any rubric that we were to use for grant proposals. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Emily, to build it in. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments for today? Thank you for the feedback about the, the unit and how it's connecting to different projects that you're working on. Okay, well, um, get in touch with the Google group if you need to before uh, Monday and or Wednesday next week and best wishes until then, farewell.